when the root came and the world was thrown into chaos. Much must have filled the minds of those that experienced the first wave of catastrophe and destruction. Among these thoughts, a prevailing concern was that of safety. Where to live once the plague hit and familiar places were no longer safe? How to survive in a world that no longer offered haven? A world that was no longer really meant for humanity. For a lucky few, Ward 13 became home. Here, among the dilapidated stone and makeshift riggings, those that still hold out for hope strive to carve out a life. Captain Ford, the founder of Ward 13, secured it from assault by the Root by cutting its crystal's connection to the outside world. In doing so, he made sure the Root would not be able to enter easily. But what exactly was Ward 13 before it became a sanctuary to those trying to escape the chaos of the outside world? More importantly, what was its original purpose? For that, we will need to dive deeper into the history of the place and those that first walked its halls. Ward 13 was once part of a large complex of secure research facilities which was spread across the United States. Before the old war began, Ward 13 was the location of where the US government ran tests on the red crystals and made their first attempts at contacting other dimensions. Here the dreamers were born and the first link to a guardian was formed. When we first arrive at Ward 13, we are told to activate a nuclear reactor which powers it. Here we are giving our first hint of the lower levels, though we are told not to go beyond, as Root makes the lower areas of the ward an unsafe place. If we investigate further, the area is locked off and requires a keycard. We can find the keycard at the Founder's hideout in the main world, stashed among some research papers and a letter. Past the main doors, the scene before us is eerie and unwelcoming. The main hall lights flicker and fail above empty medical beds. The walls and floors are stained with age and disuse. There is a palpable silence that can only come with a distinct lack of life. The main hall leads us down deeper into the area. Opened or broken doors to our left lead into small offices. Discarded medical supplies and equipment litter much of the open space, and computer terminals still flicker with life. To our immediate right, we see a secondary corridor. Immediately after that, we see our first body, twisted in agony. A tray with surgical tools prepped beside the bed and a projector flickering nothing onto the wall. What exactly could they have been doing here? A red warning light urges us not to pass, but we continue. The carnage seems to amplify the deeper we venture. A locked room with two bodies inside, still wearing military clothes. It seems like they sealed themselves in and never escaped. At the end of the hall, we find two final rooms, one filled with blood and bodies, both military and medical. On a table we see a covered gray humanoid form, mostly obscured by sheets, but the feet show that they have not decomposed like the rest. Directly across, we find the site of some sort of explosion or implosion. A large section of the wall and floor is completely missing. Finally, the hall leads to a winding set of stairs which end at a locked door. Returning to the entrance, we are left with only questions as to what happened here. Further investigation is needed. Looking through the terminals and reading the entries as well as finding a notebook within the locked room, we can begin to piece together exactly what happened here in the time before the evacuation. Our first clues can be found in the terminal next to the gray humanoid form. Gabriel, also known as Subject 2419, was the third dreamer to be brought online within Ward 13, and the first to make contact with an active species. The Fuzzy's Planet, a literal massive living world that hosted smaller sentient creatures dubbed as Fuzzies. This was Ward 13's first successful connection to a world with living beings, so observations through Gabriel were done of this world. After some time, they found that the guardian Gabriel was connected to was being attacked by the Fuzzies, though no reason could be found. The attacks became more severe and signs that they were affecting Gabriel physically showed as well. Some of the research team wanted to wake up Gabriel and end the connection, but the lead scientist, Dr. Harsgard, refused. On April 3rd, 1966, the Fuzzy's World's Guardian was killed by the inhabitants and subsequently, Gabriel died of cardiac arrest immediately after. So Gabriel is the preserved body inside of the room, the gray form that we see covered by sheets. This posed a few questions to the team. How strong was the connection between the Dreamer and the Guardian? Why would the Fuzzy people kill their own Guardian in the first place? And more importantly, what happens to a world when its guardian dies. 
Next, we can move to the terminal across the hall from Gabriel's room. After Gabriel, two more dreamers were linked to new guardians. Harshguard was attempting to link a dreamer with an unknown entity named Clawbone. We will learn little of this entity here. However, Clementine, subject 3323, was linked to a world comprised mainly of ice and snow. Through Clementine, it was observed that guardians could show emotional distress which would manifest within the dreamer as well. This backed up what was found with Gabriel's incident. In the terminal within Clementine's room, we find that she would become physically uncomfortable if her room was not kept at a low temperature, which was believed to be caused by the fact that her guardian existed within an extremely cold world. We learn more about these incidents from the notebook of Mark Klinger, which can be found in the locked room above the stairs. During August of 1967, Clementine began to show strange behavior. She would have manic episodes while linked. Notes show that during these episodes she would show absurd strength and objects would fly around the room. During one of these incidents, a telescope flew across the room on its own and struck a doctor in the head, causing severe damage and forcing the doctor to receive 27 stitches. Here we also learn that Clementine was a 13 year old girl. Her origins are unknown, but it seems that the dreamers were not necessarily willing participants. During a final incident, Clementine was shifted out of reality. The cause of this event is unknown, but it explains the large hole within her room. That was the last of the subject that was observed. Finally, Dr. Belinda Marsh's office and her terminal. In February of 1967, Dr. Marsh's team was able to reconnect a dreamer to the Fuzzy's world. Subject 2419-1 dubbed Casa. Once the connection was established, the team found that the world had gone through some drastic changes. The planet no longer resembled a large living organism. Instead, much of it was covered in root-like growths. A new species of plant-like beings was observed actively eradicating the original beings of the planet. Their origins are unknown and no evidence of them was seen during Gabriel's time. During this, we can infer that the destruction of the original Guardian brought the root to the Fuzzy's world. The planet was deemed too dangerous to send physical expeditions to. On January 1968, almost a year since Casa was brought online, she began showing strange signs of activity. According to notes within Dr. Marsh's terminal, she began sinking to a specific set of parameters and would not respond to being shut off or sedated. Soon after, Root began appearing within War 13. Many of the personnel within were killed, as well as the Dreamers, all except for Casa. Dr. Marsh realized the Root were attempting to keep Casa alive, and that she was the gateway through which they were coming in. Dr. Marsh, along with a few others, sealed themselves within a room, along with Casa. And so, she killed Casa in hope of sealing their way through. Still, it seems as if her efforts were in vain, and the Root had already made their way here. So this was how the Root came to Earth through a portal to a world already infected by them. And with that, we learn a little more of what happened here in the past. We also come to learn that Captain Ford, the founder, was one of the heads of research here within the facility. So he was around when the first attack began. Despite now having a better understanding of what happened here and how exactly the route came to Earth, we still have many questions left unanswered. How exactly were the dreamers used as gateways? What happened to the other wards outside of 13? And more importantly, who was the founder and what is his role to play in all of this? We will look deeper into the founder's secrets and his role to play in the grander story next time. Be sure to subscribe to keep up to date with lore videos from this and many other games.